I am here with Andrew Methvin, who is the founder of Slow Chinese, which is Meizhou Manwen, not to be confused with the Slow Chinese podcast. When I, when I first heard you mention Slow Chinese, I remembered a podcast from many years ago, uh, which is also a good resource. But I was delighted to see what you're up to over there at Slow Chinese, because I think that there is... It could be a very valuable resource, especially for people who are at the intermediate to advanced level. Um, and maybe you also have some stuff for beginners as well. But I wanted to get your perspective on using um, you know, real language, which is a phrase that you use for how you learn Chinese, and also you know, how you can maybe can combine that with an immersion type of learning. So anyway, Andrew, welcome. And uh, maybe you could just introduce yourself and talk a little bit about slow Chinese. Sure. Thanks, Phil, for the opportunity, and it's a pleasure to talk about uh, my project, Slow Chinese. Uh, so the actually, the name in Chinese, Major Manwen, is probably a better description of what it is. Mm. Uh, so it's a weekly newsletter, and the character Man means broad or deep. Uh, and what I try to do every week is I read into the news, the Chinese news. Uh, I try and uh, follow what, what people are reading or hearing about in the English language media, but then I'll read into how it's being discussed in Chinese. Mm. Uh, and then I, I, I kind of go deep uh, on the kind of language that's being used in this context, but you probably wouldn't find in a textbook. Mm. Um, and so normally it tends to be idioms or colloquial phrases, slang words, and then also ne neogalisms as well. And what is, it's, it's really simple. So I, I um, pick a story, uh, I literally copy and paste uh, the kind of language that I think is interesting from, from my own perspective, but also from a language learner's point of view. Um, and then I explain the words or phrases if they need explaining. And then I offer example sentences for each one. <clears throat> and so there's the opportunity to understand the word, see it in context, and then also practice it with a real kind of sentence as well. Mm. So you must have done some type of you know learning before. I understand that you used to live in Taiwan. Uh, and so tell me about your learning process for Chinese before you got to slow Chinese. And then I'll be curious about, you know, what was the uh, impetus to get it going. But yeah, tell me more about that. Yeah, sure. So I, my, my first experience of learning Chinese was when I, I, I traveled to China in 2002. Um, and so I, before I got there, I had no experience or exposure to China or Chinese at all. And I, I arrived there. Uh, I took the train uh, from, from London. And the, the original plan was to take a two or three months, travel through the, through the country and then carry on to Southeast Asia. Mm. Uh, but in the end, that, that first trip, I spent about a year in China. Mm. And uh, I traveled in, mostly in, in the kind of places actually that most Chinese wouldn't go to, you know, the kind of uh, the countryside and, uh, you know, the depths of uh, Sichuan or uh, Tibet or Gansu is one, another one, Qinghai. And so I had to learn a little bit of Chinese to get to literally get from A to B. And uh, I just really quickly became uh, really attracted to the language. And I think also it's deceptive when you first start because it feels like it's, it's not easy, but you don't have the same constraints that you do in a European language. So the grammar was, to me, seemed like there wasn't really any grammar. Uh, and you could use really simple kind of language to get your point across. And it was my first experience of actually le trying to learn a language on my own. And so I was really kind of taken by that. And then eventually I settled in uh, Taiwan and then I really uh, focused on trying to learn it. And the way I did it was just that actually it was through immersion. So all day, every day I was listening to the radio, watching news, reading news articles that I could, talking to people. And then I would gather everything, the things that I learned that I felt like I could learn depending on my level and committed them to memory. So through memorization, lots of practice. Um, although I was self-driven and self-taught, I did. I found a teacher um, in a language school <clears throat> in Tainan and she was really helpful. So I would take the language that I found every day and with her, I would try and understand what it was. And then I would listen to her speak it and then I would repeat it. So um, yeah, I think it was definitely through an immersion approach that I really, really went from beginner level, which I think is relatively easy to get to, mm. to then going through the kind of more uh, into a more advanced speaker of Chinese. 
Right. And so during that process, I think that the hardest thing for people is less the uh, mechanics of it, although I would be curious about uh, certain mechanics for how you immerse yourself, but it's more the um, psychological barriers, right? So you want to it, have Chinese around you all day, but it can be overwhelming perhaps. And so it's you know the kind of thing where it's hard to stick with it. So what did you do to keep motivated and keep the Chinese on as much as possible? Uh, and, or were you inspired by anybody, you know, that type of thing? So I wasn't really inspired by anybody in particular, but I was just inspired by the feeling that gradually I was getting better. Mm. Uh, and of course there are, there are times, you know, particularly in the, there was just one period and I actually, I still get it now sometimes when, you know, you, you feels like your Chinese has gotten worse um, or, you know, you, you don't, fully understand something I, I i still get that now but in the more intensive period i would go through what felt like a big jump and then would feel like i then regressed a bit mm. and then would plateau for a long time and then take another big jump uh so i uh, yeah i mean it can be really demoralizing and it certainly was i think the reason that i kept going was um yeah i was just true really uh inspired by the language you know especially when you learn something that's two thousand years old yeah um and you know that that you kind of understand the background and the history to that and then it feels like for me it felt like i i understood a little bit more about china uh and for what what in, in fact what inspired me throughout was the fact that you know you go to china and it's so impenetrable mm. um and uh, you know, when I arrived in um, in China in, at that time, 2002, you know, all the cities were kind of grey and dusty and, you know, it felt really alien. And then you gradually go into the language. And then my, my realisation was that actually everything is all everything is hidden in the language. Um, and right. so that's what that's what kept me going. And just the, the feeling of when you do get feelings of getting better, it's, it's just really rewarding. Yeah, I definitely – there's – obviously, there's the reward you get from uh, success. You know, success tends to breed motivation. Um, I would I – I'm curious if you could expand a little bit more on what you said, like – when you said that everything is hidden in the language, you know, I, I have, you know, some thoughts about that because I, I learned some Chinese and it makes a lot of things make more sense in, you know, how Chinese people behave around me and why uh, I see certain phenomena and I don't see other phenomena. Um, but I'm curious what you discovered, if you can think of any examples where you felt like, okay, you know, like just to expand on that phrase of everything's hidden in the language, it's a very interesting point. Uh, I'll, I'll give you an example from what I've been. So, my, my, for example, my newsletter this week, I'm looking at how people discussed a certain proposal during the um, the two se two sessions, the Liang Hui. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, there's one particular proposal that was made a few days ago that was kind of derided on social media <clears throat> as out of touch. And I've just been looking into the kind of commentary around it. So, for example. There's this phrase I've found, which I've kind of heard before, but never really paid attention to. Okay. Which basically means you've eaten too much and you've got too much time on your hands. Or like, you know, the, 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 this, guy is, this guy's got too much time on his hands. Oh, but it uses the word, but it uses the, the you know, the, the, the act of eating. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. in Chinese to mean you've got too much time on your hands or, you know, you, 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 should, you should be doing something better. The, uh, the idiom that's used is around food. And then another one that I found, uh, I'll give you another one. Uh, let me see. Yeah, so fan, let me just double check this in case I've got the pronunciation wrong. Fan hole, mm -hmm. which is rice bucket. <clears throat> right, yeah. So fan hole is like a way to criticize someone that's got too much time on their hands. Oh, right. Uh, you know, yeah, so again, it's using food uh, and the fact that this guy's got too much food, he's got a massive bucket of food. Uh, therefore, he's got too much time on his hands and he doesn't know what he's talking about. And so it's just things like that where uh, you find patterns. Uh, whereas in English, you don't really use, you've eaten too much, therefore you've got too much time. You don't use that way to explain a, a phenomenon. Whereas in, in, in China, obviously, uh, eating is a really crucial part Mm -hmm. of explaining life yeah. uh, and it might be it might be something positive uh, I can't think of any examples but I'm sure there's an example you know for example <clears throat> uh, the word xiang 
嗯哼，呃，过得很香。So again, you know, that's like fragrance, and food is fragrant, and life is fragrant. It, it's it's kind of the food is just a really important part.、So、that's just one small example that I happened to think about this morning as, as I was reading.、Uh, but there's so many, you know, how、uh, so you know warring how, how idioms from the warring states period、uh, about battles and killing and death and competition and strategizing in war. Are now used in kind of entrepreneurial、uh, endeavors in China today.、Sure. That kind of thing, where actually the the, con- the conceptual thing is the same. It's just the context is completely different. So it's those kind of things. Yeah, absolutely. Because the immersion, what immersion、uh, with Chinese helps with, is recognizing that it's actually a very simple language. But then the like. Really advanced Chinese is actually quite difficult because so much of it is referential to these different historical periods or cultural tropes. So it's kind of like, on the one hand, there、uh, words that are not、um, idioms that are just explanations for what something is,、uh, even if it's something like the、uh, position that you have in Parliament or something like that. You can often look at the characters and understand it instantly, right? So it's in that sense, it's very.、Um, You know, it, it's simple comparatively, but then, in another sense, you have the stuff that's like what you said. Okay, we're going to use this wartime strategic tongue、yeah. in the context of business. It's not that war and business never get like that happens in a lot of languages. I think that you use war like metaphor for business, but、uh, which is probably misappropriate, <laughs> inappropriate generally. But like still,、um, the because usually business is cooperative, but still. Uh, you know, but then you have this. If it's from the Warring States period, well, you better know something about the Warring States period, otherwise you're not going to get it. And so、um, there's certainly that that happens. Although I think that that's something that people don't generally have to worry about too much until they get to a point where they have a really solid foundation in everything else. But still, it's one of the most fascinating things about the language. And I think you can only get there if you were to use an immersion type approach, because otherwise you don't have enough context for even understanding. Like you can understand, you have to understand what you don't know. So when they say the、um, warring states time idiom, you need to be able to catch it and go, wait, what was that? And so it sounds like, in a lot of ways, that's what slow Chinese is about. It's almost like you're listening to stuff and then you're saying, oh, that's really interesting. So if I find this interesting, somebody else might. And then, so tell me about like what's in a newsletter at, at, at Slow Chinese. What, give me like an example of like what somebody might expect if they're a part of it. Yeah, so so what, what what I generally do is I'll find find us a news piece that I think will be interesting in terms of how it's discussed、uh, in China.、Uh, often it will be kind of following the news agenda in in the English language media, but not always.、Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'll, I'll then read into how it's being discussed on social media. I'll read a few articles in Chinese about it、um, in the business news and maybe、uh, more the kind of mainstream media. Um, and then I will. What I what I always find is that pretty much any article that I read, like long news article, there's always like a few things that are new to me.、Uh, Maybe an idiom, or it might be a kind of、uh, neoliberalism, or something, you know.、Uh, and so it's that kind of one to two percent、uh, of of the language that where it is where slow Chinese happens. So I will take. Um, you know, idioms or colloquial phrases that are that are being used. For example, one I'm doing this week is "jie ling hai xu xi ling ren." So,、okay. the person that has the, the person that unties the bell has to be the person that tied the knot in the first place. In all, in other words,、uh, whoever whoever made the problem has to fix the problem.、Oh, okay.、Uh, so it's things like that. So you might have a whole article. And you know, as you know, news articles in Chinese can be really long and like very hard to get through. But I force myself to read through them, and what I find is, you know, basically understand most of it. And before I started this project, what I would do when I read an article, I would just skip over the bit that I didn't understand and just kind of guess. But now, what I do is I find something, and I, I think, right, that's that's the interesting bit, and I'll, I'll then kind of read into it, learn about the background. Sometimes, like I said, it's an idiom that's evolved over the centuries. Sometimes it's a completely new word or a slang word, 
or often you get dialect words that are, you know, from Cantonese or from uh, northern northeastern Chinese. Normally, is a, also a popular one. Mm-hmm. And then I'll just kind of read into what it is, where it came from. Also, I think um, again, what I found is the context piece uh, is really important in the newsletter. Mm-hmm. And from my own experience of learning the language, having the context and other reference points is really helpful. Uh, so, you know, even where did, where did I learn it? So in this case, it's easy. It's in my newsletter. Uh, what was the topic? Uh, oh, it was Alibaba and a protest happening in the canteen, let's say. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, you know, what's the background or where did it come from? And then I'll, I'll, I'll look into that. So, for example, the Alibaba one is a good one. Uh, I learned a really good gaming word. So Chongta, Chongta, which is from League of Legends, Okay. So when I don't know if you remember last year, there was a protest by a female employee in Alibaba uh, be, uh, because she was it was like a whole kind of Me Too uh, kind of moment for Alibaba. Uh, it, it looked like it was going in a positive direction and kind of uh, she made a positive statement and Alibaba took action. But the whole thing is that she was uh, the, the word used in Chinese was chongta, which means to kind of attack the tower, mm-hmm. which is from this game League of Legends, but it, it's, it's come to mean taking on authority. Okay. So that's that was a word that used to be in a computer game in Chinese. It then crossed over into like social media chat, and it then became a real life word that was used to describe a situation, a serious situation in the real world. Mm-hmm. And so it's things like that, that that I think are really interesting. And so. I've got the context. So where was it? What was it about? And then where did it come from? Mm. Um, and for me, uh, it, that, that just helps consolidate everything. So as I remembered that then, I was thinking, what was the story? What was said? And then what was the background? And I, that, that, that's what the newsletter tries to do. It tries to take the really hard to understand and remember bits and makes them easier to remember, hopefully. Yeah, no, that sounds great. I I imagine that if I were to do that, if I were to like read that particular newsletter, um, and I'll I'll be curious if this is a part of what Slow Chinese does, but I would make a flashcard that has a picture of League of Legends, maybe even like a screenshot of a part with a tower, and then uh, also have an Alibaba related picture. Maybe there's even a picture of the something related to the protest. And then those two images can quickly get there. And then, of course, you know, if you already know Chongta, then you're, you know, the characters, then that'll make a lot of sense there. So yeah, that's a, wow, that's a great idea. And I think that that's the type of thing that a lot of people, you know, one of the things we were talking about with Ali the other day is that, um, you know, when it comes to language, there isn't, you know, a way to to do it. Like, it's not like there's one way to become proficient. You know, we obviously like to build the foundations here at Mandarin Blueprint. What we do is essentially uh, break it down from the basic pronunciations into the basic characters and build from the bottom up. But we obviously tell people, but you need to come into contact with the language in many different ways. And then, of course, once you get to a certain level of foundation, the the way that it fans out for different people is so individual that you couldn't possibly plan it for them. Like it would take your whole life just to make plans for different people. So it's like what you're doing is perfect for the type of people who either a are just interested in like the very complicated types of um, idioms and want to understand that and get to it at a very advanced level, but also news junkies, you know, like people who are interested in what is going on with all that stuff. You know, I find that my biggest problem with the uh, Chinese news is not as much that, I can't get through it because if I'm interested, I'll get through it. But it it, it depends on the article. But it's that it's the writing style. What bothers me about it is the um, the uh, the repetitiveness. They're con- they're constantly saying the same thing over and over. Like I I, I watch um, uh, or I follow uh, Zhong Xinshu, um, which is Zhong Guo Xinwen Shu, and I read their articles and it's like if they're going to talk about what Wang Yi said today for some reason they repeat it like four times and it just drives me nuts I'm just like okay I got it yeah let's like get to the point you know so um and of course there's always the other thing that bothers me about it which is that I just know it's a little bit of the mouthpiece of just the media uh, propaganda wing of the government which isn't even really you know like so but it, th- that's interesting though in its own right for different reasons but then i like i like to find the like for example uh, i'm sure you've probably come across uh Mei Guo Zhiyin, which is like the sort of western yeah yeah that's kind of fun to look at and that's also another kind of form of propaganda but it's also at least it's 
the alternate opinion a lot of times, which is kind of good to see. Yeah, but, so, uh, yeah. I mean, my, my experience of reading the news is, for a start, I, so state media, I generally, I mean, I sometimes dip into, but as you said, it's, it can be quite dry, unless there's a particular, particularly interesting topic. So, for example, a good one last year was this whole thing about, um, uh, what was it? Uh, uh, so like mm. chaotic practices in uh, I think there's a number of different stories but one is about um, celebrities leveraging their positions as kind of famous people to get uh, uh, so, so that was a good one that's kind of chaotic fan groups so when it becomes a political issue sometimes you get really interesting articles Mm -hmm. uh, that are quite short, uh, but generally the the, the state media I tend to avoid reading. The best ones uh, in terms of kind of China mainland media outlets, uh, thirty six K R Sanshiliu Ke is a good one, mm -hmm. um, yeah. and then the other, another one Peng Pai the, the the paper is also a good one. Um, and what I found just because it's I've got a lot better at reading the news, so mm -hmm. generally skip the first paragraph because that's the summary. Yeah. Uh, scan the scan the second paragraph because that's the first paragraph. Yeah. And then I'll go to the bottom and read the bottom paragraph. Yeah. And normally, if it's an interesting article, first paragraph, well, the second paragraph, and the bottom paragraph will be the most interesting. Yeah. So I get a quick feel of is this a good article to read just by kind of reading the second para and then the last para. And then if I get if there's a couple of good idioms in there, then I'll invest the time to read the whole thing. Yeah, that's a good that's a good piece of advice for anybody reading the news, because I mean, there's so much stuff out there, you know, and you don't want to, I think there's this sort of um, type of personality that's very completionist. And so if you like, are a news fan, you might want to read everything, but like, like, don't waste your time, you'll get bored really quickly. Otherwise, you got to find you got to find the stuff. And that's a good technique. And you're right, the first paragraph is often you, you can skip it uh you can kick because they're going to just repeat it anyway so um yeah that happens all the time yeah it's like it's it's funny how you know the different domains you know news or uh you know books or audiobooks or or podcasts and all of these different things you know for anybody who's interested in them these days there's more and more resources that get very specific to your domain and like you know i'm a podcast uh fan um and i kind of sometimes like think that it would be useful for advanced learners to have kind of a a podcast guide of some sort you know and so i've been thinking about maybe working on something like that because there's so many things out there and podcasts at least they're a little bit less regulated or even probably understood by the government, like even what's going on there. And so you could probably find some interesting stuff. And of course, there's lots of people who aren't saying anything political. The interesting thing about that, I think a lot of people mistake about China is they think that because there is censorship, that therefore nobody is saying anything interesting. But it's really just that there are censorship on a few things that are very clearly defined. Um, you know, sometimes not, uh, you know, sometimes something will get censored and you'll be like, oh, I didn't see that one coming. But uh, a lot of times it's just like, don't directly criticize the party. Don't talk about the three T's, uh, Tiananmen, Tibet and Taiwan. Uh, don't now don't talk about Xinjiang. But like those if you there's so much more to talk about in, in the world. So it's like many people will have very interesting stuff to say. And I think it's a bit of a shame that in the West, we tend to go, well, they don't have free speech. So it's almost like we go, they don't have free speech. So therefore, there's nothing to learn. And it's like, no, no, there's so much to learn, because it's got this, it's hidden, it, it, it's built on a foundation of these 1000s of years of these different memes traveling through the society that kind of move through unconsciously it's like and they're in, it's in the language in and of itself the idioms the words you know people i had this guy say to me once that you know why do you think that Taoism is a part of chinese culture anymore like there's so few Taoists as a percentage of the population and i'm like because Taoism is in the language like there are certain there's so many things where you know if you were to say a phrase or, or an idiom that there is uh nested in the phrase something that Lao Tzu said, right? And you're just like, well, exactly the, that's exactly for me. That's the, that's the, that's the inspirational bit. You know, when you get something like that and then yeah. you kind of understand where it came from and it's like older than Western civilization. Mm. 
and yet yeah. people are still using it today and it's the same language it basically means the same thing but it's just deployed in a completely different context you know that that's the cool thing and that that you can i think you probably only really get that in chinese i don't that, there's probably not any other modern language where you yeah. can access such a depth of kind of interesting stuff right um, exactly. and also to your point about the uh, discussion yeah I, I i totally agree with that and i found that as you said there are certain issues that you just that you know they they just don't get discussed certainly not online anyway um but then there are other things where there's so much interesting debate going on right um and there, therefore when there's interesting debate there's interesting language to be learned um and so so now during the two sessions you know what one of the one of the things i like to do is look at the more kind of fringe proposals that have been made uh, during the MPC uh, sessions. And then what you find is some of them, so the one I'm looking at this week is, so an NPC delegate um, suggested that uh, celebrities shouldn't endorse computer games. Interesting. And so, yeah, so, so, uh, so, <laughs> and this is all about fan quan, luan so, And so on one hand, that's like a mainstream topic that you would think is kind of on message and people would generally agree with. Mm -hmm. But uh, the debate was really kind of lively. So you got people saying, "Well, that's ridiculous. You shouldn't. You shouldn't even bother doing that because, you know, a celebrity endorsing a game won't make any difference to my child who's addicted to computer games." Whereas other people are saying, "You know, you're talking rubbish. You've got to talk. You've got to. You know, you have to stop this. With you know, you have to kind of stop the celebrity fan culture." Um, and so it's you know so much interesting language, and and furthermore, it's directly criticizing. Uh, a, a delegate during the the two sessions, so it's not like you can't have a critical opinion, right? Um, right. And uh, so, that, so you know that to me that that that's really interesting. That because obviously I don't live in China now, so my only access uh, is through reading. Obviously, you know, with Chinese friends and colleagues in the UK as well. But to kind of tap into what people are discussing, uh, the only channel is through the media. Um, and I've been surprised at how much interesting and kind of diverse stuff there is. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, um, you know, one of the other things, too, is that a lot of times when somebody does cross a line of some sort, um, the consequence is not like, I don't know, they're black bagged and gone forever. The consequence is often just like it gets removed and nothing happens to them. Maybe they get like a warning or something. But and I mean, again, I'm not. Uh, I'm a free speech guy. I think that it they it would be great for China if they uh, change this policy. But what I'm saying is that the mistake that Westerners make a lot of times is they think that because there isn't uh, free speech, that therefore you know there's nothing to learn or nothing to glean, and that's just it couldn't be farther from the truth. There's so much interesting stuff happening, and it's also it's almost fascinating to see what you can say. Like you know, just reading the stuff about the um, uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine is very interesting because, of course, it's not you know people make comparisons to China, but like just hearing recently Wang Yi just being like, you can't make this comparison between Russia and Ukraine and China and Taiwan, and then you kind of like it's fun to read between the lines. It's like, is he saying that because he really thinks that, or is he? saying that because he's trying to get people off the scent and you've got like it's just fascinating to watch and then the language in within it is also you know of course a source of fascination and so i love that what you're doing because i think that this is the type of thing that can be very motivating for people to keep immersing because you know eventually well just continuing to gain knowledge, I should say, because it's not just about immersion, although immersion is very uh, helpful, but like there's, you know, learning new characters, learning new words, making flashcards, uh, you know, sentence mining, all these different things you can do because you're eventually going to get to the point where um, these types of pointers that you're giving in the newsletter are going to be incredibly resonant with people. And so like, if they're not yet, and they're, if they're in their too early a stage where knowing what's going on at the National People's Congress isn't uh, to the point where they're, you know, into it yet. Well, that could be a motivation to keep going. And so, um, but I am curious, do you have anything that's a little bit more, uh, for you? Have you done anything that's more towards like the, uh, uh, beginner level, not necessarily beginner, but like just simpler comparatively. So no, not, not intentionally, but what I've started to do in each issue is I'll try and take some of the basic words mm -hmm. that, uh, are for more for, for a more advanced learner 
uh, are not that kind of challenging. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, as an as an intermediate or advanced learner, you may not have them uh, at your fingertips. Uh, so that's the first thing. Um, and then the second thing is, I don't, I haven't gone that far yet because this is, I mean, for me at the moment, this is a side project. And so I, I tend to just do the stuff that I'm interested in, sure. but I do present, it's mostly in English. And so I'll explain the context in English. Uh, I'll then outline the words and give translations and then do an example sentence with the translation. Mm -hmm. So I, I hope that <clears throat> there's enough English content there for the, for the more kind of intermediate and perhaps even more, uh, beginner learner to to get something from and I do have on my kind of the broader readership that read the free newsletter mm. uh, I think I have a mix of all kind of abilities even though yeah. it's more catered towards the more advanced end um, but yeah I think you know if if someone that's a beginner or even doesn't know any Chinese um, can take a, a word or two or a concept to or, or two from the newsletter then I think that I think that's a, I think there's value there in, in, in that case even if they're not going to learn 10 new words this week. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we're big advocates of making sure that you do things to confirm your identity as a Mandarin learner or as a Chinese learner, because that's what part of what keeps you going. You know, habits are maintained less because you achieve goals, but more because you identify with uh, the behavior. So if you say, I'm a Chinese learner, I'm a Chinese enthusiast, right, then you will... Uh, get dopamine release from doing activities that confirm that identity. And this strikes me as absolutely in that vein, because even if you don't, if the, the technical Chinese language is far above your level, if you're learning about it and then, you know, taking one or two things out of it, maybe it's a good idiom that you learn and you make a nice flashcard out of it, or, uh, you know, just a word that you like for whatever reason, or just a person, maybe as a, a person who you pick up on, um, that, absolutely reinforces your identity which will in turn lead you to want to keep improving and then you it seems like your newsletter would continuously be useful to people whether they're at the beginning and they don't understand the language yet or you know obviously advanced learners will pick up on stuff all the time i mean like you know chinese is really a lifelong process uh you know i've been doing it for a long time now but it's like you said, there's not a day that goes by where I don't see something I've never seen before. Uh, so, you know, because infrequent words are not frequent, but they're also all over the place because there's so many of them. So <coughs> well, uh, yeah. this is it. And and also, so, <clears throat> I'll, you know, I'll find a new word. I can't think of one off the top of my head, but, you know, I'll find a word that's totally new to me. Mm -hmm. And then I'll, I'll check it with a, a like a, a Chinese friend and, and, you know, they'll say, yeah, that's I, that, we use that all the time. Mm -hmm. And yet in more than 20 years of learning Chinese, I've never come across that word. Yeah. And so you, you, you're totally right. They're, they're lower frequency, but they're still really useful. Mm -hmm. uh, and also I've found that um, one thing that is really encouraged or like kind of self-motivating is, is when you try and use a word like that in a real context. So you use like a, <clears throat> uh, you know, the word far or sign. So kind of Vasali's literature, which basically means something like mm. you're showing off your wealth through kind of complaining about something that's ridiculous. Like, you mm. know, Oh, my driver, he's so annoying. He has to wait. You know, I can't, he can't come to the door to pick me up kind of thing. Right. Uh, the English translation is uh, humble bragging. So something right. like that, right. you know, you drop that into a conversation and they're like, wow, you are so current. How do you manage that? And then it kind right. of covers right. over the other bits, you know, maybe you get a few tones wrong or you forget another word. Sure. Uh, so it's things like that where you can generally impress people actually quite easily, just knowing a few kind of more current or, uh, you know, more difficult or lower frequency words. Uh -huh. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, that's it. You know, uh, and that can be very motivating when you impress people and when they're kind of, you know, if you make my favorite thing is if you can make a table of people laugh. That's like always the most. Well, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not just like, like, look at this bald guy, you know, but uh, yeah, I can see. But um, yeah, so that's, that's fantastic. All right. Well, I, I think that we have a pretty good sense of what slow Chinese is all about. But I guess my final question for you would just be, you know, if you were going to give advice to somebody who is in their early stages of learning, uh, you know, it's a big project, obviously, and it really kind of never ends in a certain way. So if you were to give advice to anybody who's in this process, um, how to stick with it and, um, you know, yeah, what would you say? 
So uh, I think, first of all, find the thing that really excites you about it, about the language. So to your point, you know, where's the dopamine hit coming from? Mm. So for me, it's I see an idiom I don't know and I learn the backstory. You know, I get a proper hit from that. Uh, and so learn, like work out what that is. Uh, so, you know, it could be, for example, some people love to learn karaoke songs. Mm. You know, they get there. That's where they get their hit. You know, I can't stand that. But I think if you've got to find what what where your your own drive is coming from, what you love to learn, why you like why you love to learn it. And then the second thing is. Uh, I think you, at any stage in learning, you can really focus on fluency and pronunciation. And the way I did it was to just practice and memorize chunks of language. So as you get more advanced, you can do longer sentences and even kind of short paragraphs. Uh, but I think if I were to go back and do it again, I would focus much earlier. And I think this is where Mandarin Blueprint is fantastic because you really focus on like how the bits connect together and the tones and everything and the pronunciation. Uh, so I would do I would focus on that. So finding short bits of language that I can use in day to day life uh, and memorize them, get the tones right, get the pronunciation and the kind of rhythm of the language right. Even just really short sentences like ordering it, ordering a dish in a restaurant or, uh, you know, just like something to say during the kind of standard things you say mm. uh, during a dinner you know, um, and they're, they're actually really basic language um, kind of units that you can learn. So I would, I would do, that, do, do those two things. Focus on what you really love about it and kind of use that to keep going. And then uh, impress yourself by getting really good at pronouncing short chunks of short bits of language that you can use in day-to-day -day life. And then that also will then keep you motivated. Because I found, and I'm, I'm sure uh, you did too, is that it just suddenly seems to click together with uh, tones and kind of rhythm and everything. Mm. It's really hard work, but I just remember having one moment of realization when I was in Taiwan. Is I kind of said something in a conversation, and I realized I got the, you know, the second, the two third tone, second tone, third tone. Mm -hmm. It just happened naturally. Mm. Yeah. Um, and so it's that kind of small kind of celebrating your own success kind of thing um, that is, is also really helpful to keep you going as well. And finally, uh, in on the immersion point, uh, I found that reading as much as possible is so, is so good, so valuable. Uh, so I never really bothered reading very much. <clears throat> but since I've started my Slow Chinese project, I, you know, I read a lot every week. And I've just found that my level of understanding, breadth of language, it's, just, it's so much more improved because I, I read every week. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, celebrating the wins is is huge. Finding your passions, and I completely agree with the reading point. You know, obviously, like that's that was a huge motivation behind uh, Mandarin Blueprint to begin with. We were just like, you know, we got to get people reading as quickly as possible because that will make their uh, acquisition go much faster. And then you can get lost in the language. You know, the best thing about immersion, like for me to these days, is that I'll really get lo like. Here's a small story about this, like. Yesterday, I was at the gym and I was listening to uh, one of my favorite shows called uh, Da Kang Yo Hua Shuo, which is this guy, this uh, Beijinger. He lives in New Zealand and he does these kind of like um, uh, you YouTube um, self media type talks. And he just talks about various things that are going on in the world. And it's kind of like, you know, deep dives into the news, sort of, um, but, you know, just also political, philosophical type of stuff. And Anyway, so I'd been listening to him for a while, and then I got to the end of this one episode, and he was saying uh, that his – he was saying I might have to slow down on some of my um, – going how many uh, episodes I'm putting out a week because uh, my wife is her, uh, having bad health at the moment. And like – I like got emotional. Like I was like, oh no. Like I, cause I got, I'm so into what this guy was talking about and I felt bad for him. And I like had this like sudden, like I was like, you know, obviously came and went like all emotions do, but I was just, it, it struck me that the only way I could possibly feel for this guy is because I've been lost in what he's saying and lost in the points he's making. And then when he, I find out that his wife is not in good health and he needs to take care of her. I like, you know, it, it's kind of one of those, it was just one of those moments where I went, you know, this has been worth it to to uh, learn all this Chinese and to get through this process because it's created an 
a natural empathy that you couldn't possibly have otherwise, you know, otherwise it's just a bunch of sounds this person is making and you wouldn't feel anything about it. So, uh, the, I think that all of this, um, advice is very helpful. So yeah, uh, great stuff. I really recommend everybody check out your, uh, newsletter and, um, where can they find it? Uh, so if you just Google, uh, slow Chinese Substack, which is published on Substack, mm. um, you'll find it uh, or slow Chinese Andrew you, you Google that you'll find it yeah um, and then it's yeah it's on it's pu- I publish on Substack every Saturday morning um, it's a free newsletter there's a membership as well which goes deeper on the, using the content as a resource mm. um, yeah but it, it's hopefully it can be useful for re- for students of all levels but particularly I would think kind of HSK four ish and above Right, right. Excellent. And I, I understand you also have a column on Sub China, right? Yeah, so I do. A, uh, I really enjoy this. It's um, on Sub China, China. I do a, a phrase of the week, uh, which mm. is published every mm. Friday. And so I'll take sometimes it's one of the phrases in my newsletter and I'll, I'll go into it in a bit more depth. Um, yeah, so that's that's really cool as well. So this week, the phrase of the week is is um, jie ling hai shu xi ling ren, mm. which is the, uh, the person who caused the problem has to fix it. Um, right. And actually, that's a, that was a statement on China's position of the uh, the UK Ukraine uh, crisis. In fact, it wasn't it wasn't Wang Yi that said it, but it was the Ministry of Foreign Affairs spokesperson. Mm, right, yeah, right. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, everybody, check out uh, the Slow Chinese and the Sub China um, uh, column. And thank you so much, Andrew. Really appreciate it. It was a pleasure to chat with you. Thanks, Phil. It was really great to uh, to to to. Um, to learn about you know to kind of just explore the thoughts because you don't really think about it until someone's actually asking you the questions you know so yeah yeah it's one of my favorite topics so i could talk about this stuff all day so (laughs) likewise awesome thanks